so hey Jeff, can you hear me? Now I can. I can barely hear anyone. Okay. Um, I'll start with this case. Um, this is a 63-year-old um, gentleman, uh, and he uh, he had a he has a history of a type B remote type B dissection in 2011, and this is one of his uh, scans from a while ago. The dissection was just repaired with the endograft. This is from 2013. Uh, everything looks okay here. And uh, so he came in a few weeks ago uh, feeling not well. Um, and uh, uh, this is his uh, CT. He had a CTA when he came in. Um, this is the CTA. Um, he also has a history of uh, IV drug use. So um, in the hospital, he had bacteremia. And then this is a CTA. So you can see this um, rind of inflammation here encasing his descending thoracic aorta, right where the, also where the graft is. And then also going down beyond the level of the graft there. Um, and he also had a CT of the abdomen. Uh, so you, let me just so an abdominal CT. The phase of contrast is a little bit later, so I think it shows it a little bit better. But you can see this uh, fluid collection here, loculated fluid collection, peripheral enhancement, and inflammation. Um, so this was uh, infected. But this is uh, peri uh, perigraft infection, aortitis. Um, he went into surgery and then the surgeon uh, uh, drained this, re they resected the aorta. This was, this was just basically frank pus. Um, the blood cultures and the, what, what grew out of this uh, collection here is both serratia uh, maricens, which is a gram negative rod. Um, and it's uh, seen it's commonly seen, not commonly, but it's known to be seen with uh, uh, to cause our endocarditis and aortitis in uh, IV drug users. Um, so he he had a homograft. Uh, basically, the whole aorta was the descending aorta was replaced with the homograft, and uh, he did well for a day or two post op. Then he had a bad outcome. Okay. Um, this is a quick one. Um, it's not really a thoracic problem. It's more of a dermatology uh, case. But uh, this is a middle-aged patient. She has end-stage renal. She has diabetes, uh, type two end-stage renal disease, and she's on Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, hemodialysis. And um, this was just kind of remarkable uh, skin thickening here uh, on the back. Um, and it's not new, uh, it was there on a scan from a few years ago, and it really gets better. Uh, this isn't the best scan to show, but it, it, I didn't include the abdomen, but it definitely gets better as you go below the diaphragm, the skin thickening. So we weren't completely sure, but I know, uh, I know chronic kidney disease and uh, dialysis, both, as well as diabetes, they all have uh, multiple different uh, dermatologic manifestations. So it might be just a combination of uh, the chronic kidney disease and the diabetes causing this kind of skin abnormality. But it's, we, I mean, we see diabetics and patients with renal failure all the time, but this was just kind of more than we, more skin thickening than we were used to seeing. Have you guys seen something like that? Um, just usually with patients who have a lot of edema, but not specific to this. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of strange. And of course, the 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 notes weren't really, really helpful. The physical examinations weren't really talking about it. So it was interesting. Um, this was... 
this was something I've never seen before. Um, one of my residents showed showed us this case. Um, so this patient has uh, very severe aortic stenosis, and here's his aortic valve, very calcified. Uh, he has he has basically a very severe calcification of his ascending aorta, so porcelain ascending aorta. And so patients with this amount of calcification uh, of their um, ascending aortas and valves are uh, poor uh, surgical candidates for valve replacement. So um, you have a really high gradient across the valve. So at the time, the surgeon had one of these uh, conduits available. They're made by Medtronic. Uh, they're called apical aortic uh, conduits, and it's it's a, it's a essentially a conduit that you connect from the LV apex, as you can see here, and it just gets attached to the descending aorta, and it has a little valve um, right there. There's a little bioprosthetic valve. And so the, basically the purpose of this is just to take off some of the pressure, pressure gradient um, of the, um, that's really high here across the aortic valve. Um, so this, and then the, of course, when this patient presented severe aortic stenosis and very symptomatic, um, he did okay for two years and now he's coming back for, um, coming back with uh, really bad shortness of breath. They were wondering if this was obstructed. This doesn't look, really look like it's obstructed. Um, and here's just an MR image of it. The, I just included the um, the three the three chamber. You can see how bad the aortic stenosis is here. It's, but the valve is not really even opening. Um, and then you can see the the flow through here through this little valve. Um, so, so these are these are uh, these. Um, where's my? Here's an article on on these. Um, these have been reported. They're not very common, just because it's a very complex surgery, and I don't know uh, exactly the outcomes. I saw variable reports about the uh, outcomes of these. But it was exactly this article exactly was for this indication. Have you guys seen this before? I have not. Yeah, it's my first time. Is this a new device, Peter? No, that no, they, it's not new. It's made the device. Um, this specific one was made by Medtronic, but I saw that they uh, started making them in the '70s. I read another another article which. I can also dig up later, but they uh, started making them actually in the 50s, and they were making they were doing them a lot in the 70s for uh, congenital um, congenital heart uh, where congenital LVOT obstruction. Um, the outcomes for that weren't really good, and that that eventually got replaced by the Ross procedure. And then so at this point, these are just used once in a while for um, for basically really severe aortic stenosis where the patients are not surgical candidates. Like this case, but it's not a new device. It's just not used very commonly. Okay, and I think I have one more. This one. Let's start off with the CT. Uh, this one uh, is I forget how old the patient is, but this. They're middle aged, but this is their. This is a CT from 2008, and this patient has. Um, this is uh, sarcoidosis. And you can see it's upper lobe predominant nodules, um, some fibrosis at the lung apices. And you can see the paralymphatic nodules. So that's 2008, and this is what he looked like in 2015. So seven years later, he has some. Um, cavitation up here, kind of a thickened fibrocavitary look, um, and he has a mycetoma. And so a lot of his nodules have improved, but he has fibrosis in his upper lobes. And then I will show the CT 
from uh, earlier this month, so October 2020. Uh, he, in the, in the meantime, I think a few years ago, he does right upper lobe was resected for that um, mycetoma, which was obviously confirmed on pathology. Um, so yeah, so his upper lobe is gone. And then now in the, in the left upper lobe, he has mycetomas. And then you can kind of see this rind of tissue here. So I thought this was um, uh, basically a semi-invasive uh, aspergillus. Uh, he had a positive uh, galactoman, and, and he's somebody that's obviously a candidate for something with that, like that, with the uh, his immune uh, innate immune system is severely compromised here with this with this uh, debilitating disease. So just a good example. Uh, so Peter, how long has this been going on? Because it's probably more just under the, well, I guess like semi-invasive uh, pulmonary aspergillosis has like been replaced more with um, now subacute invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is the, or subacute necrotizing aspergillosis. Cause it's seen in mildly or moderately immunocompromised patients, but it generally progresses with necrosis over the order of weeks to months. Yeah. These are you're showing mycetomas here, right? Yeah, but I thought so. I thought this this gentleman would fit for the uh, mildly immunocompromised because he's on on steroids and he has. I mean, basically, his lungs are destroyed up here. So I and then he had a positive galactoman. And, so when you say positive galactoman, you mean in the blood? Yeah. Okay. I wonder if he had an eosinophilia and uh, IgE precipitants too, because the presence of uh, aspergillus in these cavities can lead to an allergic response. It's like ABPA. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a, you know, it's that sort of allergic phenomenon that causes the wall thickening around around the cavity that houses the mycetoma. Okay. So yeah. So I mean, so I, so yeah. So to me, this just looked like chronic, like, um, fibrotic fibrocavitary. So I, I just, I assumed it was an infection, but I, I didn't, okay, so it could just be an immune, so this could just be immune uh, response. response. Yeah. Okay. Chronic immune response, yeah. Uh, and uh, he also got a cardiac MRI, so just show those for uh, cardiac sarcoid. Uh, so we will show. So here on the left is a T2 weighted image, and you can see um, signal hyperintensity here in the um, septum, LV apex, and on the right is the late gadolinium image. You can see kind of a classic pattern: septal enhancement, RV enhancement, uh, cardiac confirming cardiac sarcoid. So that's all I have. All right, nice case, thank you. Okie dokie, who would like to go? David, do you have any cases this week? Uh, sorry, no. That's okay. Uh, Brian? Sure, I can, I can go. Hopefully, I got rid of the echo. Yeah, if everybody will mute while he's presenting, I think we'll get rid of the feedback. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yep. All right, so this is a radiograph of uh, someone in the ICU, and you can see there's clear asymmetry between the left lung, which is more radiodense than the right lung, um, uh, very ground glassy. So differential considerations for this would be uh, layering pleural fusion, asymmetric soft tissue. Um, we noticed that they're intubated in the ICU, so probably not able to follow uh, breath hold instructions for the radiograph. So uh, I presume this is an end expiration. And uh, this is a, a good example of a, what I think is probably a Westermark sign. Uh, you can see there's there's a large clot burden in the pulmonary arteries, uh, prim primarily on the right, although he does have some left-sided pulmonary emboli as well. Um, so here and here. Um, and here as well. And there's a little bit, probably a little bit of oligemia uh, on the CT. 
but um, it, it's really kind of brought out on the, the radiograph, I think, because of uh, probably expiration. Or, there's a different uh, 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 insp uh, inspiratory effort showing the allogamia a little bit better. And then this other radiograph, also someone in the ICU, also asymmetry uh, of the lungs. So the right lung looks pretty clear, and then the left lung, uh, hard to see. We see some surgical clips. We see probably some leftward mediastinal shift. And uh, this person had had a prior left pneumonectomy. And on CT, this is what their left lung looks like. So their left lung is actually completely gone. And this is a, a buffalo chest with the right lung herniating across the midline um, into the left chest. So I don't know if this was congenital or if they did it at the time of the left pneumonectomy or traumatic or what, but uh, so now what they have a call it a buffalo chest. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm going to jump on that too. Jeff, you uh, go first. Uh, the well, I was going to say bison uh, have a common pleural space, so they still have separate lungs, but the 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 pleural spaces communicate. And I'm sure David's going to jump in about the hernia. <laughs> yeah, this okay. is not this is not herniation because herniation means <laughs> that there's a barrier that has been breached, so a hole in a barrier. In this case, the um, the anterior junction line is is the barrier between the two lungs, and the anterior junction line is just rotated off into the left hemithorax because there's no left lung anymore. So the, the heart is rotated, it's dragged the anterior junction line with it. There's no barrier that's been breached. The barrier has moved. It's moved way over to the left armpit, and the right lung has been dragged across. So this is not a hernia. It's um, there's there's no barrier that has uh, been compromised. It's interesting. So, I thought the anterior junction line was usually tethered to the sternum there. No, but, but no. It, can, it can move around like this. And um, so, uh, you know, this is mediastinal rotation. So the mediastinum is rotated and it rotates more profoundly in this direction to the left than it does to the right, but it can go both ways. And the it's as if the hinge for the mediastinal rotation is the descending order, which doesn't move very much. This one has slid a little bit posterior but it, it stays pretty close to the spine. So if you view that as the hinge, the rest of the mediastinum can rotate. And so the rotation is greater anteriorly where you're far away from that hinge point. Hey, Brian, I think cool. another good point on your case, this is a nice example when there's really no visible pneumonectomy cavity. In my experience, I've seen that primarily with patients that had a pneumonectomy child, as opposed to most of our adults are left with some sort of residual pneumonectomy space. And I think maybe when they're children, the other lungs still growing and it's able to sort of fill out the space more. And so I, I don't know if the, if there's a, I don't know the reason why the, the uh, fluid in the pneumonectomy cavity clears, but I don't know if anyone else has had that experience as well. Maybe the tissues are just more uh, supple and uh, elastic and, you know, they can, uh, they can stretch mm -hmm. to reconfigure more easily. Well, interesting discussion. Brian, can you go back to the first radiograph? I, there's one question I was wondering, because I find the most common cause of asymmetry is just rotation. And one of the clues I use is looking at the axillary soft tissues, because typically if the whole chest is denser, not just the lung, it's because of a rotation issue versus if it's truly just the lung and you have sort of equal attenuation in the soft tissues, it's probably a layering of fusion or differences in density for another reason. Yeah, here's the first way to Hard to tell on this one. Yeah. I guess maybe so the, the indication of rotation is that the trachea is not centered on the spinous mm -hmm. processes in the cervical spine. So it's way off to the right. So there's a fair amount of rotation here too. All right. I was. I think your audio is out. Okay, uh, Travis, you want to go? Yeah, I've got lots. Who, who's left? Me and you. Yeah, and I. I have about what three or four, I think. Okay. <clears throat> 
Do you see my screen here? Yes, we do. This is just a, an eye test, and it shows how long things can can be present until they're detected. So this is the original radiograph. This is two years later, and you know, not really much there. I'll pull up the next one here, and this is two years after that. Do you guys, you see any subtle uh, lung cancer developing? Anybody want to take a guess here? Can you, or I'll keep going. Are you deliberately windowing it that way so that the media's time? No, not really. Okay, I'm just not trying to. Trying to sorry. Oh, oh something's sorry. coming up the um, as it goes off into a recess. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's just projection. Okay, I'll show the next one then over here. And now I'm trying. Let me stop the sync between the two. Yeah, because once you actually see it, now we'll go to the next one here. So this is now by 2019. So this thing's actually present for is five there or a six years. cavity in the left apex? Good. Yeah, this thing right here. And now you can, in oh, retrospect, yeah. maybe here. So this is one that, that um, I think is when we finally spotted this. Yeah. So it was this one in 2019, and so that went on to. To CT, so it's not a diagnostic dilemma, but this is a patient with with severe underlying emphysema, and has this large bubbly adenocarcinoma that's developed over time. And this was actually the soft tissue component. This was watched once, and then it was actually biopsied and confirmed as an adenocarcinoma, more of this superior margin. And um, I don't remember if he was a surgical candidate or not, just given his his emphysema. But I think that even if you go back here, maybe. Certainly not in, uh, you know, certainly not below standard of care to not see that thing, but I think that's probably what it was. So just a nice eye test over the course of several years of a developing adenocarcinoma. All right, let's see which, this is a patient that's had several, several images and but I think it really only takes one. I show this because we have histologic proof and it's a it's a very nice case. So this patient has some sort of, of hematologic malignancy and this is after initiation of chemotherapy and they're neutropenic. So in the lower lobes, they have a lot of pleural, um, pleural fluid, some peribronchial coughing, and of course, neutropenic fever at this point. And so this one, you can see there's the central lower attenuation. It looks like it's starting to develop a bird's nest appearance to it. And then I'll show you over the course, and this was new from a prior PET CT a few months prior. And then here it is a few weeks later, even on a non-contrast CT. And you can just see how this looks like a big infarct with a, a, a reversed halo appearance to it. And you can see how dense this consolidation is. So this got a, this progressed a little bit and then they eventually, this is a few weeks later, you know, certainly we were coming down very hard on this being mucor and obviously the implication of mucor versus aspergillus or other fungal species can just, can just be a difference in, in putting them on amphotericin or other heavy duty antifungals. And this was at the end of this month. And you can see this was one where contrast was given and you kind of just lose the arteries in here. There's no like macroscopic, occlusion, you just lose things going into there. Uh, but they ended up doing a, a lobectomy and confirmed that there was mucor with uh, with vascular invasion here. So this is all just it was necrotic, uh, necrotic lung parenchyma from angioinvasive mucor species. So I just thought it was a nice example. I'm trying to get the gross pictures, but we'll see. Um, you know, it's not as much of a bird's nest as we occasionally see, but certainly typical of a big area of infarction with a reverse halo. Now contrast that with this case. Actually, no, not that, not this one. Where is this? This one here. So this is also a neutropenic patient around the same time. And she had neutropenic fever. And not really much going on at this point in time. Then the next CT, she starts to develop this peripheral area of consolidation and a little bit of central necrosis in this as well. 
And this was complicated by the fact that she was bacteremic at this time, and she's got maybe just a little atelectasis here. So she had E. coli bacteremia, uh, but didn't really respond to antibiotics, and had ongoing neutropenic fever. And you'll see a couple of weeks later, this area is, is enlarging, but it kind of looks a little bit different where there's some surrounding ground glass and there's effusions, but there's not like the central bird's nest that we see with the other ones. And what's really interesting about this is this is a few days later, it's evolved and her left lung has collapsed because she now has this, this developing empyema. You can see there's, there's a lot of pericard, uh, para, pleural thickening. So it's either at least a complicated effusion, if not a frank empyema. And she's developed this little area of necrosis in that. And then a couple days later, you can still see after they put in a, a pigtail catheter, that this lung still has kind of failed to, re to re expand in this area. So they thought this was probably ongoing fungal infection. I wasn't too crazy about this being mucor, you know, just because it didn't have that typical evolution like the other ones did. And she's got such pleural involvement. But she went for decortication and left lower lobe wedge resection. And what's really interesting, this is the gross photo of the lung, and this is where that cavity or that, that little focus of necrosis was. And the surgeon told me she pulled out like this two centimeter ball of, that was just necrotic tissue, which she didn't take a photo of, but it came from this hole, which is this portion of the lung. So, and there was just, as you can see here, there was a lot of fibropurulent inflammation in the pleura. So, they did decorticate it. And this actually came back as the, the, the cultures came back as uh, rhizopus, uh, that should be one word, uh, pusillus or pusillus, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. So this is the one that is a, a, of the, as you can see here, it's of the order mucorales, but it's a rhizopus infection. So I think she's responding now to, to antifungals, but it's, a different presentation than I'm used to seeing with with fungal infection. I just thought it was cool that this this ball just kind of almost became a sequestrum and, and ended up in the pleural space as this infection involved the pleural space as well. So I thought the gross photo was pretty interesting in this case. Have you guys seen something like this before with fungal infections? Um, I've seen some pretty necrotic uh, mucor before, but not like a. I mean, I get, maybe it's like a like you said, a sequestrum, like a, almost like a pulmonary gangrene. Yeah. You know, you know fungal nodules are usually not as peripheral as this. So if you see something subplural, the first thing is that it's bloodborne rather than acquired through inhalation. And that's, so this, that's why I was a little surprised that this was fungus, because like I said, she had been bacteremic with E. coli, and I, that's exactly what I said. It just looked didn't behave like the typical angioinvasive fungal infection. Agreed. All right, now I've got a couple more on a theme. So this is a patient who is in his 60s and has, he's got a multi-nodular goiter, but had, a, had abdominal pain, diarrhea, ended up having hepatitis E infection of his liver, and at the time of having an abdomen and pelvis CT, they noticed this right lower lobe mass, or maybe more appropriately, mass-like area of consolidation. So he underwent a chest CT, had some not really that impressive subcarinal and right hilar lymph nodes. But this thing is kind of a, a budding. It's not really exerting a lot of mass effect on the on the pulmonary veins. But certainly, he's, this patient, as you can see, has some. Uh, maybe he does. I, I know he has a history of smoking. He doesn't really have much in terms of emphysema. He was asymptomatic, so they were certainly worried about this being a cancer. I think this he underwent a follow-up CT just prior to his bronchoscopic biopsy, and you can see that this area is enlarged. It does enhance some, um, and then the subcarinal node at this point is enlarged, and this was over the course of a month. So these findings prompted him to go to Bronk, and you want to guess what this turned out to be? Coxie, TB. Coxie, exactly. And I withheld the information. He is, David, he is of Latino origin, 
he was completely asymptomatic from a respiratory standpoint, but this uh, they got yeast forms from both the subcarinal node and the level 11 node, and this eventually grew coxie. So coxie kind of impersonating a little lung cancer here. And certainly it's not unreasonable to think this could be a cancer as the lymph nodes are a little, maybe a little hyperemic, but he started on, on fluconazole and you can see this is two months later, things are getting better. They haven't completely gone away, but oftentimes we see residua of coxie that never do completely go away. So this is improved at this point. So I've shown coxie that mimics lung cancer with bone bone lesions and everything. This was one that was kind of, you know, a little bit of a surprise. And then there's this patient who came in, this is to an outside hospital last year. And you can see there's what looks like a low bar pneumonia. He has cough and fever and maybe some other nodular foci of you know, spread of, airway spread of infection and other lobes. Now he ended up getting a CT and let's see, this was the next day and I'm not sure this was all at the outside hospital. Uh, this looks like a more like a low bar pneumonia. There is a little bit of necrosis in in here developing in the left upper lobe and then just he's got what looks like airway spread of infection throughout all other lobes. And then this one actually turned out to be coxie as well. So this is more of coxie as a low bar pneumonia. The reason I'm showing this is because this guy just came to us. This was incidentally discovered that his ascending aorta was was over five centimeters. So he had his aorta replaced. And so we saw, the first time I saw this guy was actually this pre-op CT and this is, or pre-op radiograph, this was last month. So I first saw this and was worried that this patient might have tuberculosis. Uh, but going back, we were able to get these outside images and see that this is just kind of the residua of his coxie pneumonia. And we see lots of patients like this where these things never fully resolve after, after coxie. And it's, it's just interesting because it's different than, than histo that they, these rarely calcify too, and I don't know why, but that's kind of another picture of coxie in this case. And Travis, I mean, if, if yeah. I'd seen that here, I would have said that looked like blastomycosis, but histo usually presents as a, I mean, when we see it active, it's usually a nodule or nodules right. and lymphatic nodules and then disproportionate lymphadenopathy on that side and not so much and consolidation is really uncommon for for histo right yeah but for blasto i mean i could pass that case off as blasto sure yeah and and does blasto you know does it does it resolve or does it leave behind nodules and it tends and not to leave anything like behind like unless unless they get a cavity and a scar but like you said like with 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 coxie i think you've shown some cavities and residual yeah stuff. i've not seen that with blasto as it's just yeah well. it's interesting how they behave similar yet completely different and Travis, that was a film yeah fibrosis yeah. mediastinitis with coxie i don't yeah I can't think of a case off the top of my head that was confirmed coxy with fibrosis mediastinitis. Okay. No, um, you, you, you just and you don't get the calcified nodes either, so it just doesn't like to cause calcification for some reason. Yeah, it just it just hangs out in the lungs like this forever. Yeah, the first case it seemed like it wanted to go towards the mediastinum. The the first case, the like around the pulmonary veins. Right, exactly. It didn't seem like it was fibrosis. Yeah, it was kind of around the pulmonary vein, but it wasn't really it yeah. wasn't really doing you know doing anything significant there. Yeah, yeah, like right in here. Yeah. So and and I don't know is the calcification is it is it the immune response to the histo that that for some reason it incites a different immune response than other infections? I don't know, but it's kind of cool. And I'll show one more just because this is one that we rarely have confirmation of a bug. This is a 70 year old who came in with respiratory symptoms. I don't know how many negative COVID PCRs he had, uh, but certainly many. And of course, first and foremost, you know, he's got tons of central lobular and, and even you know, very discrete tree and bud nodules, which is a very atypical or really not even reported finding of, of COVID. But this guy has what looks like an airway centered infection. He's got a lot of bronchial wall thickening. It's bilateral, very patchy, asymmetric in its distribution. And of course, by this point, he has some areas 
of organizing pneumonia as well. There's some organization here, you'd probably say that that's a little bit of, a, of an atoll sign in some of these areas. And, and this actually, we, uh, this patient tested positive for chlamydia pneumonia. So that's a, that's a, a, a bug that we often don't isolate. I have very few cases in my teaching file of, of chlamydia pneumonia like this. So, Travis, I'd almost well, argue those are fairy ring signs, which when I see, I favor infection as the cause. Yeah. Because they have the little ones along them. What do you, I, I've never heard the term fairy ring, I don't think. No, I think Howard showed, or it was Howard, Howard or David showed a case several years ago. Um, I had to look up what a fairy ring was. I had no idea. But it's, you know, when you, when you, after you get a, like a hot summer rain, you get those um, mushroom pops up in a ring in people's yards. It's where the fungus is in the soil. But it was described a long time ago, primarily, I think, in the setting of TB. But going back and looking at those original reports, it sure looks an awful lot like a reversed halo sign. But instead of those nice clean bands of consolidation, it's more nodular. And Interesting. It, and I think when I've seen it a few times, uh, you see it with usually granulomatous infection, but other infections too. And, you know, compare this to the reverse tailors you see with COVID. They're just, they're cleaner looking. Oh, sure. Yeah. Or with, with organizing pneumonia of other cause, drug reaction or exactly. whatever. Yeah. They're, and it's yeah. All and much more symmetric too. Yeah. And probably what it is, is just organizing pneumonia around the airways that already have central lobular nodules. Yeah. So Travis, oh, yeah. the other thing that will give you these reverse halo signs, atoll signs in the bases like this, is uh, another fungus, paracoxidomycosis, used to be South American blasto. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was the classic findings in that are these reversed halo signs, and I think basal predominance. So I thought you were leading in that direction given your fungal lead in with earlier cases today. No, I don't, ha I don't think I have any paracoxy that I can think of recently at least. Maybe you have to go to the south end of the valley to get those cases. Maybe huh. I will. Uh, I'll wrap up with this one. And I thought this was a really good pickup on the radiograph by uh, by my colleague Brett Elliker. This is a lady who, yeah, I don't know why we still do rib series here, but we do. But she came in, and I think that's part of the clue. She came in with right-sided pleuritic chest pain, but uh, he noticed this right here. This very subtle opacity medially and you're kind of losing a little bit of the heart border here on the right and if i can find on one of these oblique rib rib radiographs it kind of it persisted too or a little bit or yeah let's see like right in here he was wondering if this was the same thing so that turns out to be close to where the pain is you can see the rib markers a little bit more lateral but she underwent ct to further evaluate whether there was a lung mass or something, but it turned out to be here. And I think that you know, we've shown lots of cases of mediastinal fat necrosis. This one is a little atypical because it's more of, of it's more anterior in location. And rather than being right along the pericardium, it's more along the anterior pleural surface. But I think that's what this is. We've got a little bit of, of atelectasis in the lung next to it. I think in, in more than half of the cases we show, you also see an ipsilateral pleural effusion. I'd like to see that here, but we don't really. I think you're just seeing mostly splinting or having difficulty taking a big breath. But do you guys agree? It just looks like an atypical appearance and location of mediastinal fat necrosis. Yeah, and I think you see it on the radiograph because of the atelectasis around it. Yeah, that may be true, right? And it's kind of because it's kind of getting to that right heart border right mm -hmm. there, the tangent that you should be seeing. That's a great yeah. call. So, yeah. So I will stop there, Jeff. All right. Thanks, Travis. All right. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's see what I got here. So you, you see my screen okay? So this is a non-chess case, but it's something crazy I came across today when I was looking at a chess radiograph and noticed, this is the abdominal radiograph, that there was a funny looking gas collection in the abdomen. 
And if you look on this abdominal radiograph, you can see these funny lucencies and what we expect of the locations of the kidneys. This was a diabetic patient who came in quite sick. And this was his abdominal CT. And there are some chest findings, actually. There's a lot of gas in the right ventricle, which would be a little unusual even for a just a little bit that gets in during an IV. You'll see this is a non-con, but um, you know we see a little bit of gas sometimes in there from the peripheral IV. We don't worry too much about it. That's a little too much. And then as you go down, you'll see there's gas in the portal veins. And then um, as we come down even further, there's just tons of gas in the kidneys. Uh, there's a little bit in the inferior vena cava, I think right in there, layering out the renal vein. And then um, going down, there's gas. There's probably other gas, but there's a gas in the wall of the bladder. So this is uh, emphysematous cystitis, pyelonephritis, with just a real, and a diabetic, poorly controlled diabetic. Here's the coronal. You can see it all, almost all in one view here. But this is just the most striking case I've ever seen. And of course, this is associated with a very, very poor prognosis. But um, you just sometimes see some funny stuff below the diaphragm on chest radiographs, but that's what that was. But just wanted to show it because something we don't, really see very often. Okay, we'll go back into chest mode now. Um, let me see which one I want to start with. Oh, this was a this was an unfortunate case. This was a really bad trauma. This was a motor vehicle crash. Um, and you can see there's um, clearly a regularity of the aorta here, but um, most of that seemed maybe to be plaque. But uh, this patient was hypotensive upon arrival. And you can see uh, as we get down towards the bottom, the liver clearly looks abnormal. There's a lot of blood in the abdomen. Um, and then just right here, um, there's just a funny um, blood right at the IVC. So this was on the chest CT. But if you look on the abdominal CT, which is done, of course, at a later phase, we see lots of blood where the IVC should be and this irregularity here and this abnormal thickening. And so this is a avulsed IVC with a severe hepatic laceration and blood in the in the peritoneum. And unfortunately, this patient ended up dying uh, as a complication of this rather quickly, as you can imagine. This is a tough place to operate. The IVC is very thin and hard to get to at that area here. So uh, this is most of these patients don't even survive to the hospital because uh, they bleed so much. But this is they, the whole IVC was avulsed here from the um, from the, the junction with the right atrium and the liver here. But harder to perceive on the uh, chest CT because you're so early in your contrast phase. But just it's, it's just too much tissue right around that junction. If you window it a little bit, you can just see it doesn't look quite normal there. Uh, okay. Um, this is a, a nice example of this infection. So this patient presented with cough and fever. And of course, everybody's thinking COVID, but not everything is COVID. And so this was the initial radiograph done somewhere else. And there's some um, vague consolidation in this left lung, maybe a little bit here on the right, and then maybe a little bit here on the right upper lobe, but you know, it could be COVID early on, but, but rather quickly this progressed. So this was at presentation and this was the next day. And you can see rapidly it became bilateral. Nice example of a detector artifact here. Um, but you can see this rapid progression is a little atypical for COVID and it's a little more central. She had already had a negative COVID test by the time she was transferred here. And then so that was the initial one. And then just rapidly after that one, so this was the next day, it became even more confluent and fluffier looking with air bronchograms. So looking less and less like COVID. And then finally, uh, this was the radiograph where the patient becomes intubated and um, you can see um, rather extensive lung disease. So this, um, when I see rapidly progressive consolidation that often starts at least what appears to be unilateral or mostly unilateral that rapidly becomes bilateral, uh, the one thing I, I remember learning from David was uh, always think about Legionella. And so this, this is Legionella pneumophila. Um, just an isolated case, there were no associated clusters or outbreaks, and it's unclear what the source was, but it is a cause of community-acquired um, bacterial infection, and I think the clue, again, is rapid progression. It's usually bilateral, typically, I think, within about 24 hours or so. I don't know if David has any commentary on Legionella. So Sometimes it presents bilateral, so, you know, the, the clue that I 
I was was taught was uh, if you see a bilateral pneumonia at at the presentation, Legionella is really high on the list. So mm -hmm. same point you're making. Yeah, but one one you know just not everything that is yeah as bilateral as COVID, even though Wisconsin's having bad COVID right now. All right, this is a good perception case. Um, if anybody wants to take a stab, it's not particularly hard. But it's a good one for uh, some junior residents or even some senior residents is why we have to look at certain parts of the chest radiograph. This one's more along the right paravertebral or yeah. as it goes off the somewhere in there. Yep. Yeah, there you go. There's an extra bump here. So in this area, you think of a paraspinal lesion, a neurogenic tumor. It's really smooth. Um, maybe something vascular back there. So this is something I actually don't, we don't see very often, but very simple explanation. It's just a nice lipoma here, sort of paraspinal. And you're more likely to see a hernia containing fat from the abdomen coming up there, but this is just a true lipoma. It looks to be like a little capsule around it maybe, but just, it, I thought it had a really nice radiographic interface, not too hard if you look at these a lot, but remember to look down here as well. And um, you can see finding uh, look always down on the paraspinal lines because sometimes that's where stuff likes to hide. The lateral is going to be a bit more challenging. It's a little full back in here, but it's fat. I don't know if that's I mean, that's probably just all they were to anyway since it was paraspinal. So just a fun so the, case. The, the, uh, hiatal hernia, you know, is also on the list for that. Right, and sometimes they just contain fat. But that, but the thing about hiatal hernia is it will obscure the back wall of the heart, and in your case. The back wall and lateral view was very crisp, so it True. wasn't idle. True. Good point. Okay, um, this was an, uh, somewhat of an interesting case. So this patient um, has esophageal cancer and had a stent placed as for palliation of that narrowing um, on the um, uh, at the near the esophageal gastric junction and you'll notice the stent orientation is kind of odd and there's some funny gas in the upper abdomen and we see some gas down here as well and it was um, apparently it was a very difficult uh, procedure and they were concerned about a complication so here is the post procedural CT now this patient also has some other findings I'll come back to but you see there's some uh, contrast still in the esophagus and then here we follow the stent down so here's the stent, and then there's the esophagogastric junction. And if you keep going down, you'll notice the stent doesn't really go in that direction. It continues laterally here and slides along the wall of the stomach into this abscess cavity down here in the upper abdomen, just simply this anterior to the um, retroperitoneum. So this is a, a perforated stent. So because of the cancer and, and the difficulty in this, the stent was deployed um, not through the lumen, but it looks like outside of it. And, um, and communicating with this um, abscess cavity. So the, uh, and you can just see that um, on that. The patient also has um, had had COVID in the past, and you can see some sequela of that. The COVID was uh, about, I want to say it was over a month ago. Uh, we got some pneumomediastinum tracking up, presumably from the abdomen. But all of this is sort of a subacute acute lung injury here. There is some dilated airways. It may be transient, but I think this far I'll be a little concerned there could be some developing fibrosis. Uh, so they, they ended up with, as far as the uh, abdomen going, as the surgeon uh, went in there and they did an exploratory laparotomy. They um, removed the stent. They placed a Blake drain through the defect and ran it up the esophagus. They placed a Jackson Pratt drain here to drain this. They washed this all out. And then they put in a feeding J genostomy. Uh, they, they couldn't move the stomach. It was adherent to this cavity, so they couldn't do a percutaneous gastrostomy. So they treated it with just a clean out in their, and drainage and will feed the patient through the small bowel while this cools off. But um, I've, we've seen since migrate before, but I've not seen one actually perforate through um, and probably the, the tissue was undermined at the time anyway, and it just takes the path of least resistance. So that was kind of crazy. And then um, this case, I showed you that one. Yeah, I think I showed them all. Yep, that's it. That's all I have this week. So lots of abdominal stuff, but 
All right, well, I think that's it, unless anybody has any additional cases. All right, well, I'll talk to everyone next week. Thank you. Bye. Great case. All right, thanks. Yeah.